So next up, we're going to have Ahmed Saadadeen, who's a filmmaker, producer, creative writer, actor, and grassroots organizer dedicated to sharing untold stories to raise awareness and create positive change. As a public relations major at the University of South Florida, Ahmed organized the largest grassroots campaign in the university's history, collecting more than 10,000 signatures calling on the school to divest endowment funds from corporations complicit in human rights violations. So Ahmed, really looking forward to hearing your tales from college and maybe from since college. Hello, everyone. It's an honor to be here. Um, my name is Ahmed Saadadeen, and I'm a graduate from the University of South Florida. While I was there, I served as the president of Students for Justice in Palestine for two years, and I was one of the main organizers of the divestment campaign that took place there. My presentation today is going to be about campus activism, uh, overcoming obstacles and suppression, and achieving success. So I'm going to start with uh, the obstacles that I think are very difficult for SJPs to overcome. Number one is active suppression of student organizations by student government and universities. And number two, the demonization of Muslim, Arab, and SJP students and activists by pro-Israel organizations. So I'm gonna try and help you understand uh, some of the obstacles that we face by sharing with you my experience at USF and what we went through over there, and then trying to tie it in with what's going on around the nation. So in January 2013, we started our divestment campaign. I went to student government and I met with the Senate president who was in charge of creating the agenda for the meetings. And I shared with him a copy of our divestment resolution. It was just a draft at the time. And I asked for advice. I was trying to learn more about the process. How does it work? And he told me, you should attend the student government uh, meeting later that evening. And uh, he asked to keep a copy of our divestment resolution. So I couldn't make it that evening, but a couple of our members could. So they went to the meeting and they stayed and they learned and they took notes. And at the end of the meeting, a complete stranger came up to them, got in their face, put his finger in their chest and said, dead on arrival. They're shocked, what, what is, who is this guy? What is he talking about? He goes on to say, if your resolution touches the floor, I'll veto it. It turned out he was a student body president. So obviously we were very disturbed by that. So I went back, I'll explain him. I'll show you his picture in a moment. His name is Brian Goff. Anyway, um, I returned to the Senate president and I told him what happened and he said, don't worry about that. He won't veto it because I won't even let it touch the floor. I'll never put it on the agenda. I sent your resolution to the university legal council and they told me that divestment is illegal. <laughs> so before we even started our campaign, we were told no political stances, dead on arrival, no international politics, and it won't even touch my floor. So this was very concerning for us, especially since two months before we started our campaign, the student body president sent a letter to Hillel during Operation Pillar of Cloud when Israel slaughtered hundreds of civilians in Gaza, and he told them, as student body president, I support Israel's right to self-defense on behalf of the student body. So clearly, there's a double standard about who and when we can take political stances. So after the backlash and suppression that we faced already, we gave up, right? <laughs> Wrong, we did not give up. We learned that we could get our resolution in the form of a referendum. All we had to do was collect 1,500 signatures and we could get it on the ballot for student body elections. But there was one problem. We learned on Tuesday night that we had to collect the signatures by Friday. So we only had three days to do it. So we gave up, right? Wrong. We collected 2,500 signatures. It was the largest petition in University of South Florida history at the time. So we collected the signatures, we followed the rules, we got it in on time. So it got on the ballot, right? Wrong. The night before student government elections were to begin, we received an email from the student body president, the senate president, the university lawyer, the assistant dean of students, and the election rules commissioner, and they told us your referendum will not be on the ballot because it's illegal and it violates university policy. Which policy? They did not tell us. In an email uh, from the assistant dean to the student body president, she asked what's going to happen with the referendum. He responds, we will not put it on the ballot. As if it's up to him. As if he's the king, he can decide, there's no rules as if we violated some rule, we're doing something illegal, 
Clearly, that wasn't the case. Now, the Senate president, who was very aggressive with us in the beginning, told us I won't touch my floor. Turns out he had a little bit of a conscience, and he repli replied by saying, it is neither up to me or the student body president. We don't have the authority to stop this referendum. We are violating their right to the referendum process. As soon as he said that, the university legal counsel told him, if you put this on the ballot, you could be charged with a misdemeanor. And I am the lawyer, and I'm advising you, and I have to defend you, so I'm just letting you know. So he calls me a Sunday night from his cell phone, and he tells me, I want to put this on the ballot, but they're charging me with a misdemeanor. Can you help me? So I got a lawyer, and that lawyer immediately told him, if you do not put this referendum on the ballot, we will file a lawsuit. So that's exactly what happened. Now, the election results were um, bittersweet. We needed 50% plus one to pass. We got 49.55%. So we failed by 19 votes. But the overwhelming majority of students, over 2,000 people, voted yes in favor of divestment, compared to only 600 saying no. So this was very exciting, right? Wrong, because right after the results, the student body president ordered an executive memorandum ordering the election rules commissioner to invalidate the results because it was illegal and supposedly confusing. And not only that, but he started a bill which eventually passed in student government giving the Supreme Court the authority to censor any referendum. And can you guess what students are on the Supreme Court? All Hillel students. Not only did he do that, but he sent an email to the entire USF community, 46,000 people, students, faculty, and staff, telling them, I apologize for putting the referendum on the ballot. It was illegal. We shouldn't have done that. It was confusing. It'll never happen again. To get approval to send such an email, he had to get permission from who? The office of the university president. So this was much bigger than just some student body president. The administration, the lawyers, the assistant dean of students were getting involved and applying pressure. Now you might be wondering, why is the student body president such a jerk? Why does he say dead on arrival, it won't be on the ballot, sends an email to everyone telling them that we were confusing and we were violating the law? Turns out, not only does he attend APAC conferences, he leads seminars committing himself to supporting U.S.-Israeli relations. This is a tweet from Brian Goff at APAC. You had me at Shalom. Hashtag pickup line. This APAC puppet undermined the voices of thousands of students. So after all that, we gave up, right? <laughs> Wrong. We did not give up. We decided that we were going to create a petition outside of student government so that they couldn't just invalidate us, and we were going to make it the largest petition in the history of any Florida university. We collected 10,000 signatures, and we went straight to the USF Foundation, the group that manages the endowment, and we told them, here are the signatures. You ignored us last year. We want divestment, and we want it now. So that's exactly what happened, right? Wrong. The USF Foundation, in 19 minutes, they only discussed our petition for 19 minutes. I swear to God, I have it on camera. And they rejected our petition. Why? It turns out the executive director of the Hillel on our campus posted a blog where he brags about having one-on-one -on -one meetings with Jewish trustees in order to thwart the efforts of SJP. He also told them that they lied about how many signatures they collected, they're anti-Semitic, and they were bribing students with pizza. 10,000 slices of pizza. <laughs> That's got to be like $50,000. <laughs> Way over our budget. Not only does he say that, but he says that his students have been working behind the scenes to undermine SJP and student government. This is a statement from the USF Foundation where they say, we will not politicize our investments. We rejected the petition. So what message does a university send to its students when they reject a petition from 10,000 of them calling for something? What message does a university send to its students when the student body president sends an email to 46,000 people saying, the referendum you petitioned for, the referendum you voted for is invalidated, but please don't forget to vote for your school t-shirt, have your voices heard. What message does a university send to its students when the student newspaper will not cover the largest petition in support of human rights, but will instead cover a petition to bring Chick-fil-A sauce to our student cafeteria? I'll tell you what message they're sending. They want us to shut up, go to class, pay a lot of money for tuition and for textbooks, don't talk about human rights, don't talk about anything else. The only thing you can talk about is t-shirts and Chick-fil-A sauce.
Now, I felt special at the time. I thought, oh, my God, they're doing all these terrible things to us. But it turns out it was happening all around the nation. It happened at Loyola when they passed divestment last year, and the student body pr president was pressured into vetoing their resolution. It happens every year in D.C. when APAC recruits students and indoctrinates them with pro-Israeli propaganda by giving them free trips and free boat rides, as seen here in this picture, obtained from their website. It happened at Northwestern when the Israeli consulate and Stand With Us tried their hardest to thwart their divestment resolution. It happened at Northeastern when they suspended them. It happened at Loyola when they, when they gave them sensitivity training. It happened at FAU when they gave them sensitivity training. And that is all just suppression by the student government and the university. What about the demonization of student activists and minorities? This is a quote from an interview that the UCLA director of Hillel gave to a reporter. He said, Campus politics have been hijacked by a group of students who are intent to conquer the coalition of Arab, Muslim, Latino, Asian, and gay students. They're all oppressed minorities. So when APAC buys students, when they have one-on-one -on -one meetings to undermine the voices of thousands of students, that's not hijacking. But when minorities get involved, not only are we hijacking, we're trying to conquer. This is a screenshot from an event that took place at my university. This woman, Dr. Anat Burko, a so-called terrorism expert, came and told students that jihad is a holy war against the infidel. It's the personal duty of every Muslim to kill a non-Muslim. And if they don't, they're a religious hypocrite. And if they want paradise, they need to kill a non-believer. She's talking about me. She's telling my fellow classmates and students that this is what I believe. A week later, instead of passing out hum hum hummus and falafel, <laughs> Instead of passing out hummus and falafel on culture day, Hillel decided to pass out flyers saying, Islam will obliterate Israel, Islam must dominate, Islam will kill Jews. Now after all this demonization of suppression and rejecting our petition and referendum, we gave up, right? <laughs> Wrong. We came together and we raised some money, paid out of our own pockets, and we paid for a billboard right outside our university. So every student who goes to school has to see it. Saying, 10,000 students silent, silenced, and USF investments in Israeli apartheid, USF for human rights. Now, what was the reaction? What were Hillel students telling us on Facebook? They accused us of terrorism. Now, we posted that billboard two weeks after the attacks in Paris, when freedom of speech was a huge topic, huge discussion, right? Our freedom of speech somehow was terrorizing them. This is another picture that they posted after SJP and MSA had a vigil for the three Muslim students that were killed in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Some of you might have heard about it in the news. Posting a picture of a crusader, obviously referring to the crusades that slaughtered hundreds of thousands of Muslims. Another person says, all Muslims don't belong in America. That's too bad. I'm glad three are dead because all are terrorists. This is an organization called Hamas on Campus. Dima Khalidi referred to them. Their mission is to expose SJP. In one of their videos, you can see they have this crazy web where they connect SJP to the Brotherhood, to Hamas, to all these different organizations claiming that our mission is to wipe Israel off the map and that we're anti-Semitic and that we're violent. They include a picture of 9-11 as if somehow SJP is affiliated to that. You might have seen these. This is from UCLA. Uh, they were passing out flyers affiliating SJP with uh, violence, hashtag Jew haters, they pass it out all around campus, including on the mascot, SJP, hashtag Jew haters. So these are all the obstacles that we have to deal with in form of suppression and demonization. What about the success? Well, I like to think that for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And every time they push, we push back harder. So when they suppress us, when they demonize us, we get better at organizing, we become stronger, we become much more active. We expose them and document their corruption. We inc increase our pressure on student governments to be more fair and transparent. And students are realizing that if our student government isn't going to be fair and transparent, then I need to take matters into my own hands. I'm going to run for student body elections. I'm going to get involved, and I'm going to hold them to a higher standard. And at the end of the day, awareness is key. So when they demonize us, right, any publicity is good publicity. And I say that because that university student body president who sent an email to 46,000 people about our referendum didn't realize that while he was trying to demonize us and smear us, only 4,000 people voted on the referendum. He just told 46,000 people about our referendum. And we were getting flooded with emails asking, what is this referendum about? What are they talking about? Why are they silencing students? 
And I'll give you some examples of success. They ended up passing divestment at Loyola again. This time the student body president did not veto it. At ASUC, they passed divestment again. The student body president did not veto it. And at DePaul, last year, in one of the biggest victories for divestment, they passed a referendum despite the interference of pro-Israeli organizations pumping money and resources, trying to smear them and lie about them, and they still passed it. And you remember our good friends on Facebook that were calling us terrorists for posting billboards? Well, complete strangers rushed to our defense, accusing them of ignorance and hatred, and one woman told him, I'm just still confused as to why you chose the word terrorist. Well, I'm not confused. I know why, because they're a Palestinian Muslim organization, and in your head, that equals terrorists. Please take your wonder bread elsewhere with your ignorant comments. <laughs> <laughs> Lastly, I'd like to um, make the point that one of the biggest successes we have is obviously the growth of divestment, the growth of this conversation, despite the fact that they're trying so hard to silence us. So this is a map obtained from a pro-Israel organization. This is their website where they document uh, SJPs and divestment. So these red dots are places where divestment has successfully passed in the form of a, resol a resolution or a referendum. So every time they try and silence us, every time they demonize us, lie about us, every time Israel attacks Gaza, SJP spreads, and so does divestment. Every blue dot is a point where an SJP chapter has been formed and where a divestment campaign is taking place. So our message to them is no matter what you do to silence us, we will never be silent. So obviously this entire thing was very emotional for me. I was uh, invested in it. Um, but since then, my friend and I have been producing a documentary uh, titled Suppression, in which we're trying to document all this and tell our story. So if you don't mind now, I'd like to share with you the trailer for that documentary. Is that something you all would like? Yeah. All right. Thank you for your time. The Israelis and the Palestinians have been fighting for thousands of years over some little rock and it's like, no, that's not it. People are starting to say, well, we support Israel, but you seem to be killing a lot of civilians. And so the response from the Israeli government is to say, you have to understand that we're, we're fighting terrorism. But we sure we shall have the upper hand in fighting the terror as well. We shall not give up. It has to be stopped now. Support Israel. It ignores the fact that you have a, a military occupation of Palestine. There's nothing more that people in the Israeli establishment want than the continuation of the peace process. And it's because it's been all process and no peace. And it's bought them lots of time to build walls and settlements, lay siege to Gaza. And it's bought them time diplomatically to avoid the consequences of maintaining an apartheid state. If a state is a Jewish state, people who are of the Jewish religion have preferred status, have extra rights and privileges. So that would make it an ethnocracy, not a democracy. If you're not Jewish, you're going to be excluded, ghettoized, or in the case of these Africans, put in camps, which even the president of Israel, Reuben Rivlin, has called concentration camps. Israel, small as it is, is one of the largest arms producers, arms exporters in the world. When they market these guns and these missiles and these drones, they say they're field tested. Now, combat proven. And not every military and not every arms company can do that because they don't have 70 years of dominating, controlling, and attacking the rest of indigenous population. Tariq's story and Mohammed Abu Qadir's death has made a difference. You know, people are curious to know what's really going on, and they are finding out what's going on. And you have the rising leaders of Israel using genocidal rhetoric. Moshe Feiglin has called for Palestinians in Gaza to be exterminated and put in concentration camps in the Sinai Desert. And so when I report this, which is all factual, and when David Sheen reports it, we get called anti-Semitic. But this is the, these are the facts. When I hear what people say about us, you know, just because me and my friends, what we do, raise awareness and have these events and people label us as extreme, radical extensions of Hamas, you know, all these crazy things. And I'm just passionate about this conflict because I see oppression and I just want to speak out about it. We collected 10,000 signatures. This is the largest student petition in the history of any Florida university. This is like 
as big as it's going to get. So if you're going to ignore 10,000 students, I don't know what comes after that. It's so important that we speak out here in America because we are responsible for the occupation. We are funding it. We give Israel billions of dollars a year. It's our duty to speak out and say, listen, we're paying taxes. We don't accept this anymore. People are losing their jobs over this. I mean, their lives are being absolutely destroyed. One day, you will be walking in the streets as a respected professor, and the, the second day, you're in solitary confinement. When you are brought to the courthouse, they have snipers over rooftops. They take you in a helicopter like Tampa is under attack somehow. I mean, it was, it was unbelievable. It was all the creation of the government in order to bring this to the jury that somehow we were so dangerous that they needed all this protection. And in the end, the government drops the charges. Oh, okay, after 11 years. So you can't help but feel like, what if, what if this happens to me? So thank you so much, Ahmed, Amani, and Dima. What did I say about the new generation of leaders coming up? Yeah.